Each year, the students of the Gold Humanism Honor Society nominate a speaker from our faculty to speak at this ceremony. And this year, Dr. Christian Collier was selected. Now, why was she selected uh, from among the 3,000 faculty that we have here at our medical school? It wasn't because of her scholarship, although that was, that, that's very noteworthy. It's not because of her teaching awards, which are many. It isn't because of her patient ratings, which are enviable. The student and their faculty advisees see in Dr. Collier the kind of physician they want to be, a caring physician somebody who uses the art of medicine to bring out the best in the situation. And as the Humanist Society often advocates, this is the doctor's doctor, somebody with a heart, somebody we would want to go to for our own care, or who would I bring my mother to? Who would I bring my daughter to? Dr. Collier grew up in Michigan has been at our university since she entered as an undergraduate in 1993. She's been on our faculty in general medicine for the past 17 years, where she is an enormously popular teacher and physician. She is joined today by her husband and her children. Dr. Collier, congratulations on your nomination by our students from our Gold Humanism Society. We are lucky to have you at our school and we look forward to your remarks. Dr. Collier. Good afternoon. I'm quite honored to have been chosen as this year's White Coat Ceremony Speaker. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to everyone who has joined us for this special day, especially to our new students, their families, and their loved ones. For a medical student outside of graduation, this is the day in your professional life that in my opinion means the most. It represents the line between the before and the after. This morning you walked in here as a layperson on the outside of the profession and this afternoon, you will walk out of here as someone on the inside. And that's what I want to talk with you about today. How to make it on the inside. And not just how to survive, right? But to thrive and to flourish. But before I do, I want to acknowledge the deep wounds our community has suffered over the past several weeks. We have a great deal of work to do for healing to occur. And I hope that for today, for this time, we can focus on what matters most, coming together to support our newly accepted students and their families with the goal. With the goal of welcoming them into one of the greatest vocations that exists on this earth, the vocation of medicine. I was once like you, sitting in that very seat in this very auditorium in 1997, that mixture of excitement and nerves, sort of wondering how I got here and how I was going to do it. Was I worthy of being here? Did I make the right decision? Why didn't I go to business school? But in my remarks today, I would like to share three pieces of advice that I hope will help you flourish on the inside. The first one is, you are not a machine and neither is your patient. The second one is ask big questions. And the third one is practice gratitude. Regarding the first one, you will soon realize that doctors speak in a language that is quite unique to the profession. One of the phrases you will often hear is when someone says something about a colleague like, oh, she's a machine. And it's often used in a way that's laudatory, where someone's respected because they seem to be getting stuff done often in a very superhuman way, not needing sleep, cranking it out, being super productive, etc. While we of course respect folks who work hard here and accomplish much, 
I would remind you that not only are you not a machine, but neither should you strive to be one. Because in lapsing into that way of thinking, you strip away the very essence of what medicine is. You see, medicine is not merely a technical endeavor, but above all else, it is a human one. In the great work, The Grapes of Wrath, John Steinbeck writes a story about a family of low resources during the Great Depression who are driven from their home because of drought and economic hardship. It was a time of great expansion of technological and industrial advancement, especially around the vocation of farming. Steinbeck reflects upon the nature of man when he writes, quote, carbon is not a man, nor salt, nor water, nor calcium. He is all these, but he is much more, much more. And the land is so much more than its analysis. That man who is more than his chemistry, that man who is more than his elements, knows the land that is more than its analysis. But the machine man, driving a dead tractor on land he does not know and love, understands only chemistry, and he is contemptuous of the land and of himself." End quote. Let's read that last line again. The machine man understands only chemistry, and he is contemptuous of the land and of himself. What if I substituted the word patient in for the word land? He becomes contemptuous of the patient and of himself. I'm sure you've heard a lot about the crisis of physician burnout. This syndrome and its causes are very complex. But the result of burnout is depersonalization where you can start seeing the patient in front of you, the one that you went into medicine for, as a non-person. And you can become truly contemptuous of the patient. There's just something in your way of getting out of this place. And your feelings toward yourself can become disordered as well. You will soon start learning a lot of biochemistry, a lot of pharmacology, a lot of histology, and that's great. The science is really beautiful, and there's so much science to know. But the risk of this education, and the one that I fell into, was that you could come out of medical school with a bioreductionist, mechanistic view of people, and ultimately of yourself. You can easily end up seeing your patients as just a bag of blood and bones, or viewing life as just molecules in motion. I assume that most of you didn't come into medicine to take care of a receptor, a symptom, an organ, or even a disease. These things are important, but they are happening and inside human beings. Don't take your eye off the ball. You are not technicians taking care of complex machines, but human beings taking care of other human beings. And human beings are fallible. You will soon become all too familiar with all the ways in which human bodies are fallible. And this profession can test the limits of your bodies as well. Unlike a machine, you do need sleep, food, rest, relationships, and most of all, love. If we become mere machines, then we can just step aside and let robots be the next generation of physicians. To be fair, robots can often be more accurate than we are with diagnostics. They can be faster. You've probably seen more stories of robots of late being built to provide care in nursing homes. But machines and robots can't care for anyone. Task completion is not care. Medicine is an embodied profession where two people come together in one of the most sacred relationships that there are. You get to know your patients as human beings, not just their scans, labs, chemistries, and data. The disease may be unique, may not be unique, but every person is. Let's resist a view of our patients and ourselves that strips us of our humanity and takes away from the very goal of why most of us went into this profession in the first place, to take care of human beings entrusted to our care in their moments of greatest need. Number two, ask big questions and lean in on the humanities to do so. Many of you have come to us from liberal arts colleges and universities and have studied big questions in fields like anthropology, sociology, theology, philosophy, and literature, to name a few. Not only is now not the time to stop asking big questions, but probably at no other time are the big questions more critical to ponder. And if you haven't had a chance to ask big questions, now is the time. 
Your answer to these questions has real impact on real lives. Questions like, what does it mean to be human? Why do human beings matter? Who do we include in our moral sphere of concern? What is health? What is medicine and what is it for? Biomedical education, as we have discussed, is science and technology heavy as it should be. But let me tell you, once you're in practice, the scientific questions are not the hardest questions that you will face in your day-to-day -day patient care. The great ancient philosopher Aristotle wrote about three types of knowledge. The first one is episteme. That's bare scientific knowledge, like concerned with knowing what something is, the facts. The second type of knowledge is techne, which is knowing how to do something mechanically or procedurally, and today encompasses the copious use of technology. And the third type of knowledge is phronesis, which is a very different type of knowledge from the other two in what today we would call wisdom. Phronesis is practical wisdom, knowing the why towards what good of something. Modern medicine is excellent at both episteme, knowledge of the what, and techne, knowledge of the how, but philosophical questions or questions of the why are largely absent in the practice of medicine. The phronesis or why of medicine cannot be explored in a technical model. Philosophy has literally translated the love of wisdom. Medicine needs a philosophical lens to be able to see why medicine knows what it knows and does what it does. And without such a lens, medicine robs itself of a proper understanding of its goals, meaning, and purpose, and reduces itself to a mechanistic production. To give you an example of what asking a big question looks like, I give a lot of talks on bioethics. I love asking the question to my audience of what is health? People assume that they know the answer, or that everyone has the same general idea of what health is, but often folks actually haven't had an opportunity to really ponder that question. The best answer I ever received on this question was from a med student here. She told me the following. She said that she had been an anthropology major in Iowa as an undergrad and had done qualitative research interviewing farmers, asking them what they thought health was. And she said time and time again, the farmers kept saying things like, I don't consider myself healthy unless the soil on my farm is healthy, the crops are healthy, the animals on my land are healthy, and my neighbors are healthy. It was a beautiful antidote to the impoverished answer I often get when I ask what health is, which is the absence of disease. And instead speaks to a vision of health that extends even beyond the individual and speaks to a communal flourishing that involves the entire created order and a picture of shalom. Your answer to these questions has real consequences as they will impact your view of the patient, what you think healthcare is or isn't, and what you might want to advocate for, write on, or research. And if you don't develop a philosophy of medicine, so to speak, you risk getting burned out and trained by the hidden curriculum to be a mere technician. Traditional medical education often doesn't teach health as shalom, but health as techne. Number three practice gratitude and cultivate the proper place of medicine. This profession, unlike many others, provides ample opportunity to become acquainted with grief. Remember, you could have gone to business school, but in becoming acquainted with grief, you will hopefully develop an appreciation for what truly matters and what doesn't. Not infrequently at this hospital, there are cars in our parking garages left behind from when someone has walked into this place and never walked back out. When you are taking care of patients, no matter how long your day has been, what you've had to do, what you've had to miss to be here, but for that moment in time, you aren't the one in the sick bed. When I was a third year resident here, my chief resident, Jake, became ill, and he became the one in the sick bed. He had been interviewing for a competitive fellowship position in academic cardiology. He had been losing weight, looking tired, but we all know he had been busy. He kept telling us that he had been busy. One night, shortly after arriving home from a flight, he presented to our emergency department with shortness of breath and was found to have a massively enlarged liver due to the presence of multiple terrible masses. We were hoping that this was something easy, or at least easier than what he ended up having which I won't even name here, because my anger at his particular disease has decided that its name doesn't deserve a place in this speech about my friend. But what he had was bad, 
end up taking his life. It was over the course of that year that our institution watched our friend die, but we also saw him live, and it was painful. And what was even more shocking to us at some level was that we couldn't save one of our own. Here we were, one of the largest academic hospitals in the world, with all the technology, treatments at our disposal, the chair of medicine at the time was an oncologist, for God's sake. Yet Jake got sicker. We couldn't cure him, and he died on our watch. We lost our friend, and the world lost a great son, husband, brother, and doctor. Those of us who survived lost additional things. Collectively, we lost the deeply held belief that medicine could be our savior. What had happened in part is that many of us had made medicine into what theologians call an idol. We had placed unrealistic hope onto something that medicine didn't deserve and couldn't live up to. When our idols come crashing down, pain ensues, but the right order of things shines out of that darkness. I have since grown to understand the limits of medicine that are important for me to realize as I grow into the physician that I need to be. I wish I could have come to know these painful truths in a different way, in an easier way. But I still talk about Jake and what he taught me about medicine and the limits of the vocation to which I have chosen to dedicate my life. So how can we not be destroyed by what we see? How can the suffering we see help us paradoxically flourish on the inside? This profession has a tendency to do one of two things. The suffering can either harden you and make you into a burned out machine, or you can allow the vocation to soften you, to cultivate compassion, love, justice, and mercy. Let medicine do the latter of the two. Secondly, medicine needs to come back to the humanities as they can help illuminate these truths most clearly. The mother of narrative medicine, Rita Sharon, once wrote that training in the humanities lets one see the suffering. She says that's what the humanities are for. She writes, what one gains by the sight of the suffering is the knowledge of the cost of this life. For those who are prepared, you receive a clear-eyed discernment of this thing, this life its worth, end quote. In conclusion, in this great work called Medicine, you should give thanks to those who have come before us. The great philosopher Alastair McIntyre once said that before you ask yourself, what am I to do? You must answer the question, of what story am I a part? You are not part of the story of medicine that's rich in both tragedy and joy, but you have the potential to shape the future of the story if you resist the temptation to see yourself and others as machine, if you ask big questions, and if you practice gratitude along the way. Welcome to the profession of medicine, and go blue. <laughs>